general strategy all the time. We might have some little tweaks to this. There's also a, a third uh, uh, category of protected, which gets into can subclasses access that or not. But right now, we're going we're gonna to just distinguish between private and public. All right, so we'll sort of shade this in a little less black and white later on. But for now, let's just talk about private and public. Our attributes are going to be defined as private. Our methods are going to be defined as public. Now, do you do that? Did you do that in C sharp? Okay. What is the reasoning behind that? Why do you make the attributes private and the methods public? something that you can plug in anywhere 
And as long as you follow the rules to connect into that box, that is, you call the methods that you need, you give the right input parameters, and you get the right output, then anyone can use this as long as they follow the rules. What I could do, for example, and I'm not doing it in this example because this is just the first example, is I could put validation code where I set the cost. All right? This says, wait a minute, you know, no matter how cheap meals are, they're not going to be a negative amount. Therefore, if I enter in a negative amount, flag some kind of error. All right? I can put that right into the class. All right? And that means that no one, by hook or by crook, can set the cost of the meal to a negative amount. Now, I'm not sure how you've done validation in the past, but you may have done validation in the past on the UI, put in the user interface that, hey, you can't enter a negative amount. All right, well, that's nice, and that will work for that particular user interface. But remember, we're not writing this business class just for the one interface, just for the one screen or view or activity. We're creating this class because it could be used in a bunch of different places. And as they say, uh, a chain's only as strong as its weakest link. Right? So, if every single user interface logic has to validate that, if one of them doesn't do it right, then you got a problem. And if the rules change about what is a valid amount, all right, then you only need to change it in one place. Another way to say it is, this, this is an example in object-oriented uh, terms of the concept of data hiding, all right, and also of encapsulation. In other words, it's a rule that meals don't cost a negative amount. All right? That's a rule. I mean, I, I don't see that ever changing in the future. All right? Therefore, that piece of knowledge which says that a meal cannot be a negative amount ought to be contained in the class about meals and nowhere else. Because the principle of encapsulation says that everything about an entity lives inside that class. All right? And if we were to validate it in the user interface, then some of the knowledge, some of the characteristics of that entity would live somewhere else. Some of it would live in the user interface as opposed to the class itself. So therefore, we put, the, we put that kind of validation in the class itself. The concept of data hiding is that no one should know the innards of a class. All right? No one should know the attributes of the class for a couple reasons. If they know them and can access them, they can mess things up. Just like if I can crack open my computer case and try to solder the mouse to the motherboard, I could mess things up. All right? I could circumvent any of that validation right? that I'm going to get by calling the method. Also, what if the implementation changes? What if, they, what if you change what you store about meals? for example. I can't think of a good example for me, so we'll consider another example. Let's say we had a class for a plot of land. Let's say our, we're a real estate company and we stored a class about a plot of land. All right. Plot of land has several different attributes associated with it. Right? It has a width and a length. Right? Might be, uh, you know, 500 yards by 200 yards plot of land. All right? Plot of land also has an area associated with it. It's so many square feet, so many square yards, so many acres. All right? Lastly, a plot of land would have a perimeter. In other words, if I was making a fence, how big is it around? Now, here's the interesting thing, if you think this through and if you do the math. If we store, and I'm going to say this, and, and I think it's accurate. All right. If I store 
two of the attributes, I could calculate the rest. So if I store the width and the length, I could calculate the perimeter and area. Right? I know that to be a fact. But if I stored the perimeter and the length, I could also calculate the area. Because if I know the perimeter, I know the perimeter. I could then use that to calculate the width, and then I could calculate the area. All right? And so on down the line. Now again, this is sort of a contrived example. But in many cases, you could store as attributes different things. And over time, there may be reason to change and to store it a different way. If people are accessing those attributes, all right, people are accessing those attributes, if you change things, that's going to mess them up. If, however, they're going through your methods, those methods will stay constant. In other words, a plot of land class will always have a calculate area function associated with it, right? If, now the details of that function may vary depending on what we're storing, but we could always have a calculate area function, and you could call it, and you'll always get the area. Irrespective of whether there is a length attribute and a width attribute, a perimeter attribute and an area attribute, any of those things. So therefore, again, by not giving people access to the guts or the innards of it, all right, and making them go through the methods, that allows for much more flexibility as far as what's changed, much less chance of someone messing things up by circumventing validation or anything along those lines. So that, in a nutshell, is, where, is why we make the, the attributes private and the methods public. All right, let's look at what the methods are. Now, typically, there will be for any attribute, there'll be get and set methods. The set methods take an argument and set that attribute to the argument. The get methods simply return the attribute. Again, we could expand this if we wanted to, you know. There could be a get area function that doesn't simply return the attribute, but does a calculation and returns the area. Likewise, I could put some validation here into the get cost method to make sure the cost is a valid number and throw an exception if it is not. Same thing with setting the uh, level of service method. There's only three levels of service that are acceptable, 0, 1, or 2. I could uh, put some sort of validation in and return if they didn't set the proper value. I then have a function to calculate the tip. And it returns a double. This doesn't accept any arguments. It assumes the arguments are already, uh, or attributes are already set. If service equals 1, tip equals cost times 0.15. Otherwise, if service equals 2, tip equals 20%. If it's neither of those two, if it's poor service, it would fall through and have a value of zero. Notice how the if statement looks. We have if, and then in parentheses, we have our condition. We use a double equal sign to uh, indicate e equality. Um, that, again, is consistent with C sharp. And then we have, in brackets, Remember, the brackets represent a grouping of instructions together, or a grouping of things together, in this case, grouping of instructions. We have what to do if that condition is true. And that, in this case, we're simply multiplying the cost by a certain amount. Yes? Okay, so, Mike, I'm going to follow what you're saying. Um, if I put that number in there now, uh, like a focus number, a service level 5, right. I'm going to get a 0. you get a 0 tip, right, because it'll fall through okay, those. I'm reading Yes. So it has to be service level one or two. You'll get a number back. Correct. Or, or zero is also an allowable value. Zero means poor service, which means they got no tip. All right. So that's that. Again, were we to enhance this, what we'd likely do is we'd put some validation there. All right, and look to make sure that the value was zero, one, or two. And if it wasn't, then we'd throw an exception. Um, 
Um, so you take a moment and just say, yeah. okay, if greater than or... Yeah, what I would do is I would say something like if... And again, I could really do this in two places, and I might even do it in both places. I could maybe do it in the setting of the service level, or I could do it when the calculation is called. All right? Okay. It definitely has to be right when I call the calculation, right? Um, but I could also do this up there. It would look something like this. If service less than zero, or service greater than, what did I say, two? Then what I would do is I would throw an exception. Now, we haven't talked about exceptions yet. All right, and all that. But essentially, an exception is uh, like an error class. You identify that an error has happened. And you can create this. There, there is a generic exception class, but you can create subclasses from that where you can provide additional information about exactly what went wrong with this. All right? So in this case, I'm hypothetically saying I would throw an illegal service level exception. I would then have to change this method to say that, hey, this method, method might throw an illegal service level. And then whoever called this code would have to be able to handle, would have to have some code to handle that exception. All right? So essentially, that would be the right way to do it, is via exception. If you would throw an exception, which would cause something else to happen. Which would, I better have in my controller than some code to handle exception. Because otherwise the app would just blow up. All right. So that's how you would do that sort of thing. Now, we're not, I'm not really ready to talk about that um, in, in this class, but in a nutshell, that's what you'd do. The nice thing again is, then, there's a couple nice things about doing it this way. Number one, we've put that validation where it belongs. In other words, if we put the validation associated with the user interface, someone could build a different user interface that didn't use that validation and would have a mess. That validation, that rule that it has to be one of these values, I mean, that's, that's part of the model. That's part of the business logic. Therefore, it ought to be encapsulated within this class. The other thing about throwing an exception is we're telling anyone who calls this, hey, you might have to deal with this kind of problem. All right? And the compiler will warn them and say, hey, you haven't dealt with this kind of problem. And then you know to put some code in there in, in case uh, that kind of problem occurs. All right, let me remove this. Get it back to where it was. Questions about this? This is sort of a mix. The, the, this, um, this example is meant to be a mix of reviewing the basics of an Android app and a little bit of a mix of just general programming and uh, a mix of some Java stuff. I'm assuming, based on the fact that I'm not getting questions, and the fact that you all have identified as having C-sharp experience, that the stuff I'm going over is reasonably clear. Or are there questions with this? It's OK if you have questions. I wouldn't expect you to necessarily know all this. All right. OK. Let's up the ante then, and let's look at a slightly different version of this. A little bit less simple calculator. Let me make sure I can find it first of all.
is a slightly different version of this. And let me run it to show you the difference, and then we'll talk about the differences in code. Something like that. The point is, 
And, and, and I'm not talking about this from a programming perspective yet. I'm talking from a real world perspective because it's important when you build your model to think about it in those terms, to think about it in real world terms, all right? Because a banquet in the real world is different than a meal, all right? There are differences between a banquet and a meal. Now, is a banquet a kind of meal? Yes, it is, all right? Is a meal a kind of banquet? No, it isn't. What does that tell us inheritance-wise? It tells us that we, and the way that we're going to approach this is we're going to make a second class. We're going to make a second class for banquet. Because a banquet should have all the characteristics that a meal has. By characteristics, I mean attributes and methods. But there are some additional characteristics associated with a banquet that aren't associated with a meal. Or certain things might be done in a different way for a banquet than for a regular meal. So there might be differences in the behavior between the two. So there might be some extra attributes and methods. There may be some different ways of handling certain things, such as, for example, the tip. So therefore, what we have is, if I can draw it on the board, what we'll do is we will have a main class of meal and we'll have a subclass of banquet. All right, so we'll have a class of banquet that inherits from meal. We can do that because this is a true statement. A banquet is a meal. Or sometimes you've heard, you hear the, 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 the phrase instead, a banquet is a kind of meal. A banquet is a more specialized meal. It's a special kind of meal. Therefore, superclass, subclass. Sometimes inheritance is called specialization for that reason. A banquet is really a specialized version of a meal. Right, meal is a more generic term. Banquet is a specialized version. So, and now realize again that this is the, that, that we didn't talk about everything in our classes relating to meals and banquets and so on. All right, but. In general terms, if we think about this, in our problem domain, what's different between a banquet and a meal? The way that you calculate the tip. In our example, a meal has, a banquet has the same attributes as a meal has, right? It has a cost, has a level of service. We want to be able to calculate the tip, calculate the sales tax, calculate the total. And in our case, there's no additional things we want to do in the case of a banquet, but we want to calculate the tip differently. So what we're going to have in our subclass and superclass is our superclass, our meal class, is going to have all the things that we had in it before. Our banquet class is going to inherit from that, and we're going to override the calculate tip method. Because in our problem, that's the only important or relevant difference in our problem between a banquet and a 